Hey everyone, welcome to church tonight, um, and a big warm welcome if you are new or visiting. Um, here at Manor Anglican Church, we praise um, and worship God in a few different ways, and one of that is by singing, um, and we're going to do that now. So please stand and join us. So I didn't even check that you <laughs> no, no, <it's> okay. <laughs> I started talking. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed.
majesty praise forever to the king of kings to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation for our sake take you die stone was milled for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Amen. Please take a seat. coming through don't worry is that is that it oh see hey hey hey. everyone welcome to church tonight thank you for uh your your patience um it's good to see so many people here i'm excited you know why i'm excited because i just got out of covid quarantine lockdown and uh yeah yeah how how exciting how do i look i I feel like i was saying to someone earlier i feel like i lost um like five kilos from like sweating and not eating um but yeah, that's why I'm excited. I'm a bit weird because socially I haven't seen many people for a week. So uh, so yeah, just bear with me tonight. I would like to meet you though if you are new after. So come say hi. Um, don't be shy. But yeah, it's so good to be here. We've got a guest speaker tonight. So Dave, um, who's going to come up shortly. You might have seen oh, maybe seven years ago when he joined us at our youth camp, Camp 1, and, and spoke from the Bible. Um, so he's bringing us the word later tonight. Um, so a couple of announcements before we get into it. Um, we've got dinner after the service, which is heaps good. You might smell it. We've got hamburgers. Um, they're going to be at the back. If you're new, it's on us. Um, if you're a regular, you've got to pay. But I heard we have like, like the tap, the pay pass thing now, which is pretty as, so good. Um, yeah, we've also got another announcement, which is a church weekend away. So put it in your diaries. It's the 28th to 30th of October 
How good is that? Look, um, down in the Port Hacking YouthWorks um, space. So come along. Uh, more details will follow shortly, but we want everyone from all different services here at church to join. Um, I, don't, I think I did it like a bad job at welcoming anyone new. So I'm going to just skip back three steps. If you're new tonight, it is so good to have you along. Um, my name is Jamie. If you came with a friend, um, if you didn't come with a friend, that's fine. I'll be your friend tonight. But I'll <laughs> I'll say hi to you after. Um, I think we've got a bit of a video now on a series called Life Explored, so look to the screen. Uh, I'm Tim. Uh, my name's Aidan. Yeah, my name's Jason. Uh, my name is Adeline. I did Life Explored because I really wanted to uh, understand and learn more about God's work in my life. I'd never done Bible study before, so this seemed like a great entree into that. Looking to learn more about Christianity, who God is, who Jesus is, um, and how that applies to the rest of the world that I'm living in currently. Um, that, that's what I was planning to get out of Life Explored. What I got out of Life Explored was more than what I expected. I believe I got a deeper understanding of God and learning the extent to how much He loves us. Um, to anyone considering doing Life Explored, I definitely recommend doing it. It doesn't matter if you've never picked up a Bible before or if you've been a Christian your whole life, I think you can get something out of it. Cool. Thanks. So, <laughs> that was a good video. So, at Menai here, we're all about celebrating Jesus. Uh, we believe in what the Bible says is truth. And if you're someone who is going through life, who has questions about what is the meaning of life, like how does it all stitch together, and, or maybe questions around what does the Bible say about life, then that course is a fantastic thing. I've done it myself. Um, you can bring your questions along. It doesn't matter where you're at in your understanding of the Bible, Christianity. Um, it's a safe space. You come along, you watch a video, um, you eat food, you chat about what you saw in the video, you open up the Bible and read a short passage as well. Um, so I definitely encourage you to do it. It's for all people, all age groups, wherever you are in life. Um, cool. I'm going to invite a, a special guest up on stage now. Um, so round of applause for Nick. He's going to come and share his testimony. Is that one working? Work? Do yes. Oh, nice. Hey everyone. Um, welcome. If you're new, if you're not new, welcome nevertheless. Um, I've got the amazing opportunity tonight uh, to tell you about my story of how I came to know and love Christ. Um, so a little bit about myself. Yep, I'm Nick. Hey. Um, hi. Hi. Whoever said hi down here. Um, I've been at this church now for about 12 years. I've been a Christian for about 10 um, I'm a husband to my wonderful wife, Rachel. Um, now, before I sort of get into it, I want to sort of paint the scene. As a kid, I was a bit of a weird kid. Yeah, I wasn't kind of your typical, let's go and make a bunch of friends kind of kid. I was a bit of a loner. Yeah, for mostly two reasons. One, my family and I, we moved around a lot. Mostly just different houses, different neighborhoods, whatever. And two is the reason why we moved around a lot. See, my mum had a bit of an interesting taste in men, if that's what we want, maybe want to call it, yeah? Um, so the unfortunate reality for my brothers and I is we grew up in some domestic violence households, some verbal, some physical. Now, as kids, we're kind of taught to maybe run from danger. That's what our parents are generally telling to tell us. So when I would get close to a lot of other families, those kids would be taught, hey, maybe not, maybe not hang out with that kid. So I became comfortable with my own, I suppose, what do I want to call it, company. I became comfortable not really hanging out with a lot of others. Now, from the outside looking in, that sort of generates that whole weird kid perception, right? Now, some of you guys may disagree with me on this one, but I personally believe I have the best grandparents in the world. Whether you want to say you have the best grandparents, that's up to you. I personally believe I have the best grandparents in the world. Now, the reason why is they looked at that situation and said, Nick needs a home or a place that he can go and feel comfortable. So they scrounged up as much money as they possibly could, and they sent me to Innerborough High. Ooh, represent, yeah? I loved it. It was so good. I was making so many friends. I was killing it at my grades, which for those of you who knew me late high school probably find that a little hard to believe. Um, life was great. But... 
as all good things tend to come to those who have experienced that kind of hardship, it seems too good to be true. So I distanced myself. I didn't really want to hang out with too many people. How you going? And that's where our one and only Keith Pegg comes into the story. Now, some of you guys may know him, um, or as us students at Edinburgh would like to call him, Mr. Pegg, mostly because that's what we're supposed to call teachers these days. Um, that's where he was introduced to me. An absolute legend. God had obviously pointed him towards me because it's almost like I should have had a big fluorescent red, yellow, whatever light above my head that simply said, help. Mr. Pegg saw me every single Wednesday for two years, mostly just to have a chat, see what I was going in my life, see where school was at, and it was weird. Who wants to be pulled out of class other than the fact that they get to skip class, but who wants to get pulled out of class and just chat to this guy for an hour every single week? It seems weird, right? But it was great. I loved every second of it, but at the beginning I thought, what does this man want with me? Why is he being so nice to me? I wasn't used to it. So I finally scrounged up the courage to ask Mr. Pegg and I said, why? Why are you being so nice to me? Why are you paying me personally all this attention when you could be doing it with other students? And, and to this day, I will still remember it. He would say, Nick, it's not me. It's God. God is pushing me to tell you how much he loves you. And he wants you to know how much he loves you. Now, I walked away that day thinking, all right, this guy's crazy. He's absolutely lost his marbles. Who's going to go through all that kind of effort to tell this kid how some big, floaty, invisible guy in the sky loves him? Seems kind of weird, but God wasn't finished with me at that moment. I kept going and seeing Mr. Pegg. I kept having these one-on-one -on -one chats, and one day he says to me, Nick, I want you to come to church. I'm thinking, mm -mm, no, nah, that's weird. But, Nick, I want you to come to church. Our minister is preaching this week on a, on, a, on a particular type of passage that I think would be really good for you. So I went. It's really good. I can see you, Steve Wakeford. How you going? Steve Wakeford was our minister at the time, and he was preaching on the book of Romans. I was sitting right up there in the back right corner, and I thought, eh, this is a bit weird. Why is everyone singing? Why, why are we all listening to this one guy? But Steve spoke on one particular section of that passage, and that was Romans 8, 28. I think we've got a slide for it. Now it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Now God speaks in really weird ways because that exact week my grandfather who had managed to scrounge up all the money to send me to Inabara, got sick. Really sick. Doctors had absolutely no idea. We had absolutely no idea. Very scary. So I went there, spent as much time as I possibly could with them because I wasn't ready. I didn't want to see him go. That week I walked out, tried to grab the, ma the mail from the mailbox, and on top of the pile of letters was a letter that might as well have been addressed to me. It said... Life sucks, we know, but God is good. Come and, hear him about, come and hear about him this Sunday. And on the bottom of that letter had that verse, Romans 8, 28. Incredible timing. Now, thankfully, a couple of months had passed and the treatment that my grandfather was receiving started working and he started to recover, but... I was feeling uneasy because what I didn't realise is not only was I not ready to see my grandfather pass, but I wasn't ready to see him go without hearing the same message that our Keith Pegg or that our church had been showing him. So I kept coming to church, I kept having these one-on-ones with Keith and I kept trying to learn what is this God, who is this God, what is life all about? Now here at Menai we have this amazing camp called Camp One. How good. Yeah, you. how good. Now, I really wanted to go. I thought it would be a really amazing opportunity to see from a youth kid's perspective, what is this God all about? I should actually say, Camp One is this camp that our, our church does for youth kids to literally go and learn about what God is, who God is, and what he does for us. 
but I couldn't afford it. So I had to say, no, nah, can't go. Now, classic God move here, I'm telling you, a weird one. Keith comes up to me at school and says, Nick, you're going, whether you like it or not. I said, no, 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 Keith, can't go. He said, no, 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 you're not hearing me. You've been sponsored by Menai to go. You don't have to pay a single penny. All you have to do is rock up. Seems pretty good. Seems too good to be true. But nevertheless, thanks to God, Keith, and the church, I went to camp one that year, and my mind was completely blown. We had our very own Andrew Hartman, or Punchy, as a lot of you guys will know, talk about how amazing this God that we have is and how even though he owes us absolutely nothing, he sacrificed everything just so that we can know how much he loves us and how how much he wants us to be in his kingdom. So I walked away from camp that year realizing that I'm not alone. You're not alone. No matter how hard life is, there's always someone there to support you and to be with you. So I started to, I continued to read the Bible. I continued to come to church. I continued to have these one-on-ones with Mr. Pegg. But there was one thing that I wasn't willing to do, and that was share. I wasn't really willing to have someone come close to me and talk about my personal life, mostly because I was ashamed. I was ashamed that I had that life at home. And I was so ingrained into me that if anyone were to come close, they would get scared and run away. So I went to Camp One the next year, and we had a a legend called Damo come and speak to us about how it doesn't matter who we are, it doesn't matter what we've done, God forgives us, and God is there for us, and he wants to be with us in his kingdom. Now, I'm not a crier, I'm not, but that year I think I burst into tears so much it was ridiculous. I could have probably filled a pool. In that moment, right there and then, I was ready to give everything to God. I'd seen him work in my life at school. I'd seen him work in my life with my grandparents and I'd realised that without God, we're lost. I'd realised that without God, we, we have no purpose. And every time that I went to church, it's almost as if it was God telling me himself, this is what life's about. This whole, we need to tell people about God. That's your purpose. So right there and then, I gave my life to Christ and I dedicated everything to try and tell people like our fellow brothers and sisters here, who Christ is. Now, it's been a crazy 10 years since I dedicated my life to Christ. It's had its highs and its lows. There's no guarantee that being a Christian is an easy life. I've had the absolute blessing of serving on the tech team here at church. I've had the absolute blessing being married to the love of my life. And I've begged God to keep my loved ones safe from harm. But I know I wouldn't change a minute of it because I know that in all things, God works for his plan. So I want to share something with you guys. It's Isaiah 6, 8. That's something that's been working on me for a few years now. I'm, I'm a bit of a weirdo and I've, I've got it tattooed on myself as well. Um, should have it up there. Yeah. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. So for those of you who are new tonight and you've been invited along by a friend, might I encourage you that they care for you and they love you as a Christian brother and sister and they wanted you to come and hear the great news from Dave tonight about how there is this God that loves you and wants you to be saved. So that's my story. And I'd love to hear your story as well. 
So if you've got any questions or anything, please come and see me afterwards, or please come and see any of the staff members here. They're a, they're a bunch of legends. Now, I think we've got Jude coming up to pray. I'm not a very good closer, by the way, so I'm just going to hand it to him. Thank you. Thanks for that, Nick. That was actually really encouraging. That was, yeah, it was a nice story to hear. Um, so yeah, hi, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Jude, um, and I'm going to be leading us in a time of prayer. And if you don't know what prayer is, yeah, it's simply a time in which we get to talk to God. Um, and it's one of the best things about being a Christian, that we get to talk to, to a God who listens and is not silent. So uh, please bow your heads and we can pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that it is to gather here tonight together to hear your word. Father, we thank you for Nick and his testimony. We thank you that through his testament to you, we were able to take a look into how you worked and are working in his life. Lord, we pray for those affected by the recent flooding. We pray for those who have lost houses, cars, and personal belongings. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. Lord, we pray that you comfort those who are directly and indirectly uh, affected, sorry, indirectly affected by floods. We pray that you give families and communities the strength to push forward and start rebuilding their communities, and for some, even their lives. We thank you that we have emergency services who are skilled and trained to save us in times of disaster, and we pray for their safety. We thank you for scripture in schools, Lord. We thank you that we have volunteers that teach scripture to young people in the schools within our community. We pray that the ministry of scripture can continue within our schools and that your word can do work within those schools. And we pray for those who are unwell at the moment and are experiencing sickness from COVID, the flu, and other sicknesses. Lord, help those affected to recover and regain their strength. We thank you for the various ministries we have, such as bread ministry and frozen meals ministries for families who are in need. Thank you, Lord, for those who cook and those who deliver bread to families once a fortnight. We praise and thank you today as well for our overseas partners in Malta, Chris and Christy Galea, and their three children. We pray for them as they plan and prepare to run a Bible study in October with friends from their local gym. We pray that those they invite would come and that the Holy Spirit would be working in their hearts to hear your word. And we pray for their discernment in deciding whether Trinity and Evangelical Church would be a potential ministry partner and their long-term home. Thank you for the recent week of language study which boosted their understanding and we pray for growth in their conversational ability with neighbours, friends and fellow church members. We pray, dear God, that by your power you would fulfil every good purpose of your servants, Chris and Christy, and every act prompted by their faith. Amen. Great, Alex. Thanks, mate. Um, I'm going to invite Dave up on stage now. So round of applause. You got a mic? How you going, mate? Good, mate. How are you? Good day, everyone. Can you hear me? Get on. Get on. Get on. Hello. 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 There we go. It's coming. Yeah, really well. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to see you again. I feel like you've gotten taller since I saw you. You've oh. shrunk, mate. That's what's yeah. going on. Um, <laughs> you've got uglier and smaller. As a, I, that's actually not true. When I saw him, and I haven't, I mean, I really don't know Jamie, but I thought, man, that's a handsome guy. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. That's true. Um, <laughs> Immediate where, do, where do we go from it, here? Where do we go from here? Um, maybe, maybe tell us... You could us have said it back to me, Jamie, but it's fine. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, so what do you do with yourself? Yeah, um, so I'm, uh, I work as a, as a pastor, and a pastor is another word for a minister, uh, at a church on the central coast, so in Terrigal, Erina, uh, around that area. Uh, and I've been there for a couple of years before that. Uh, I was in the UK and then uh, in Western Sydney. Um, I married to Sammy, uh, and we've got four little boys uh, and someone was asked, so I drove down here tonight to, to be here with you guys, and someone was asking, um, well, someone said, oh, thanks so much, and I was like, no, thank you. Just any time away from my children is a blessing to me. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's not a joke at all. Is it? No, sol solitude in the car is a beautiful thing, but um, so my life is really uh, made up with uh, telling people about Jesus, that's what I do for, for a job, um, but love being a dad, uh, and love rugby league, Sydney Roosters, Sydney Roosters fans here. Yeah. Yeah, I knew it, I knew it. Um, that's really it, my, my family and the roosters, that's kind of what I do. So, so you live on the Central Coast, you go for the roosters. Who invited you tonight? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not you, Jamie. Yeah, uh, not me. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's great to be here. So what do, you, what do you do in your free time? What do you do for fun? Yeah, um, my life is really wrapped up in, in large part with uh, uh, the kids and what they do. Um, 
But for, for ever and ever, I grew up in the city in Sydney. I grew up in a suburb called Newtown. Um, and for me, that meant it was really, you know, it's a, it is still an incredibly diverse area. Uh, but uh, for me, it was sport, music, uh, and um, spending time with friends. Uh, but I, I realized, I think at some point in my early 30s, uh, which was around 10 years ago, that I didn't have many deep friendships. So actually now, I, I spend a lot of time trying to um, spend time with just a select group of mates and you know, hang out together or uh, go hunting or fishing or whatever it is. Um, but spending time being mates, uh, it's really important, particularly men, we suck at it. Um, so a lot of my life has sort of spun up doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, awesome. So there, you're a pastor, so you've got a faith. Um, was there a time prior to that where you weren't a Christian, didn't believe in God? Yeah, um, so I didn't become a Christian until I was 28. Uh, and I'd grown up in a religious family, but uh, religion is one of those things you really can't inherit from someone. Uh, and so I, for me, it wasn't for me. Uh, and I, I um, um, yeah, really walked away from, from anything to do with religion at all. Uh, my life went in a... Oh, it wasn't a, a terrible thing, but my life went in a particular direction. I became a father uh, in my late teenage years. Um, I joined the army, uh, and so I ended up serving uh, in the Australian army for around 11 years, uh, and um, went through a divorce, went through a whole bunch of stuff, um, but really uh, spent most of my time um, just doing whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, however I wanted. Uh, I lived in Darwin, Tansville, uh, all over the place. Um, but it was when I was 28, actually, Jamie, and, and I, I'll go into a bit more detail when I'm speaking, but it wasn't anything terrible in my life. Nothing fell apart. There was no crisis moment, nothing like that. It was actually the, the opposite. I actually realized I was doing everything I ever wanted to do, um, and it still wasn't enough. Uh, and so I called up a bloke I knew who was, who was a Christian, because my family was religious, and I knew that I, I believed in God. I just didn't know much about him. Uh, and that began the process for me of finding out about Jesus, um, and becoming a Christian. And let me tell you, uh, becoming a Christian in the army was, was funny. I did a bunch of scary things in the army, but nothing was scarier uh, than becoming a Christian and telling people that I'd become a Christian. Uh, and yet, uh, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, so, yeah, and that was around 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah awesome. Thanks for sharing, mate. Um, so we're going to hear from Dave in a second. I'm going to invite Liz up now. She's going to uh, read from the Bible. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Hi, as Jamie said, I'm Liz, and I have the privilege of reading God's Word for us. Um, our passage comes from Luke chapter 10, and it's verses 25 to 28. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. And thanks so much for having me, everyone. It is terrific to be here, uh, particularly as we're speaking about a topic which um, I'm convinced is... The most important topic we, we ever can think about, uh, certainly the most important topic in your life, and that is you. Um, I wonder, have a look at this question. If someone on the street asked you to define the meaning and purpose of your life, just inside your own mind, what would you say? How, how would you answer that question? If someone asked you, why are you alive? What would you say? It's not a question we think about very often, but, but I'm, I'm convinced it's a really important one. I've, I've heard of a, a mental exercise um, which can be really helpful in helping us grasp hold of um, the things that we value. So, so um, bear with me. I, I want to ask you to do something with me. I want you to um, imagine going to a funeral. Uh, you park your car, you walk out, and you walk inside uh, the church, and you realize when you get there that this is one of those funerals that has an open casket up the front where a line of people are paying their respects to the departed. So you join the queue, uh, and... You wait your turn, and five minutes passes, uh, and finally you get to the front and uh, you peer inside the coffin. Uh, but as you do so, uh, everything changes because you come face to face with yourself. This is your funeral, and it's three years from today. Um, 
your head's still spinning and, and you grab a seat and you look at one of the orders of service and you see there's going to be three people speaking. Someone um, from your family, someone um, from work or, or school or university or whatever that you do, but also your, your very best friend in the world. Now, uh, think deeply for a moment. Um, what would you like these people to say about your life? If you could think of three words, just three words to define the life that you've lived, what would you say? I reckon it's a really helpful uh, mental exercise for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, isn't it interesting that um, no matter whether you're religious here today or not, no matter what you think about God or, or anything like that, all of us care. All of us would care what people say about us when we're, when we're gone. All of us are in some way invested in the life that we live, which points to something that I think most of us intrinsically know is true, which is that uh, all of us, somewhere or another, think that our lives matter. No matter what you think about God, it's got nothing to, he's got nothing to do with it for the moment. No matter what your thoughts are, all of us are attached to the idea that there is a meaning to the existence that we have. Um, and the second reason I, I like this mental exercise is it does help us remember exactly how precious and fragile life is. Uh, it goes without saying, of course, all of us know this at some part of our minds, that every single person in this room will one day have a funeral. <laughs> every single one of us, it is not going to last forever. It's going to end. It's precious. It's fragile. We want to make sure that we're pouring effort and energy into things that matter, don't we? We want to make sure that in this one life that we actually do have, we don't waste our lives pouring meaningless things and effort into things that, that mean nothing at all. We want to live a life of purpose, of meaning. The question is, well, how do we do that? What, what does it actually look like? Well, the, the good news for us uh, is that uh, people have been speaking about this topic for as long as people have been speaking about anything. Every culture, every community, every country in the world, for as long as people have been speaking, have been thinking and talking about meaning and purpose. Now, what you may not know is that there is actually only two dominant answers to this question across every culture and community. There's much, much more answers, but there's two dominant ones um, that, that, have, that have dominated culture uh, across centuries, across millennia. And so tonight, the purpose of what we're going to do is really, really simple. We're going to look at both of these answers to the question of the meaning of life. Look at both, I suppose, options that are really dominant within our culture and see how they compare with one another. But not just that, but also think about how, if they're true, what does it look like in our lives to live according to what one of these purposes say? So let's get straight to it. Meaning number one, um, I'm going to define it this way. Now, it's not, a, it's not a great summary, but it's probably the most accurate one. Option number one about the meaning of life, easily the most dominant one in our community and culture, is that the meaning of life is happiness. Now, by happiness, I don't just mean having a laugh, you know, watching a comedy special or anything like that. I'm talking about a deep satisfaction, a deep contentment, a deep joy in life. In other words, the treasure of our community is that no matter what you do, so long as you don't hurt anyone, be happy. Be happy with what you do. And I think most of us would go, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. But believe it or not, this is also an ancient philosophy, Here's a quote from Aristotle writing um, you know, two and, a, two and a half year, thousand years ago. Happiness is the meaning and purpose of life. The whole aim and end of human existence. And we know within our culture, from, from the moment we're children, we're, we're hearing what at the end of stories? And they all lived happily ever after. You can't watch a movie without being confronted with the idea that whatever we do, whatever success in life actually looks like, well, happiness must be part of it. In fact, the way to fail at life is to be unhappy. What you must do to succeed is to be happy. The question is, how do we find that? What do we need to do in order to, to grasp hold of it? And so what I want you to do is I actually want you to discuss this with the person next to you. Now, if you've never met them, relax. They're not going to bite your head off. If they do, I apologize. What can I say about it? You're in Menai, you know. But I want to say, I want you to chat about these two questions just for one minute, just for one minute. Just say hello to each other. 
Where do many people seek happiness in our society? Or what does a successful life look like in our society? So I'm not saying you need to answer what it looks like for you, but generally, where do most people in our society look for happiness and success? Take a minute, turn to the person next to you, have a chat, and then I'm going to hear some of those answers from you. So have a chat about it. Okay, that's good, guys. Well, who wants to share? What did, what did you come up with? Does anyone want to share? Where are most people, many people in their society looking for happiness? What do you think? Sport. Sport. Uh, any Sharks fans? How's that going for you? Yeah, not too bad, actually, is it? You know, Manly fans, maybe not so much. So, okay, sport. Terrific. Either watching, engaging in it, whatever. Yeah. Holidays. Holidays. The dream vacation. Hasn't that been the killer of COVID? <laughs> We can't go anywhere. The only place you can go to is like, you know, Wollongong. You know, cheap. It, yeah, I won't say what I was going to say. Anyway, so, but holidays, the idea of a great vacation. Our life revolves around that. Yeah, awesome. Relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Knowing others, having friendships beyond that, romance, big time. Money. Now, here's the ugly secret. That's the right answer. That's the end of the talk. I said, no, that's not, that's not the, the right answer, like the end, the end of the talk. But are we kidding ourselves? What do you think our society gauges success by except money? You do. I do. Has anyone ever watched that show, Lux Listings? Have you seen that? Don't admit to it, I know. It's on Amazon. It's about like all the high, 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 you know, price houses in Sydney. And you watch it down in Double Bay and Vaucluse and everywhere, and you just look, houses, 40 million, bang, 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 bang. But you watch it, and always, there's always a part of it that's like, man, imagine that life. Money. Let me throw a few others at you. Relationships, holidays, sport, career, property. Now, for you guys who are under 30, sorry about that. Uh, enjoy Wollongong, that's all I'll say. But <laughs> besides that, besides that, from a very young age, we get to work, don't we? Our happiness is found in our achievements, our efforts, our, our attainment, and we do enough things, and then we'll get what we want. And yet, there's a underbelly the happiness that we all need to acknowledge when you scrape a little bit beneath the surface, which is that no matter where you seek to find it, here's the truth about happiness. Oh yeah, here's the truth about it. Whilst it's relatively easy to experience, it's very, very difficult to hold on to, isn't it? It's very, very difficult to hold on to for any period of time. I read an article about this very thing uh, the other day. This woman here, her name is um, Professor Laurie Santos. She's a cognitive scientist at, at uh, ha Yale University, one of the top universities in America uh, and the world. And she runs the most popular course uh, at her university, which is about happiness. Uh, happiness in the human existence. It's turned into one of the most successful podcasts in the world called The Happiness Project. Laurie Santos, Dr. Laurie Santos, is considered the world expert, one of the world experts on happiness. And her course is sold out if that's what a thing you do at university. It's booked out year after year after year with 19, 20, 21 year olds desperate to find out the key to happiness. Now she was interviewed by an Australian newspaper and they asked her this question very recently. Why is happiness so hard for us to hold on to? Now what she said was staggering. And I want, no matter what your experience has been with this topic so far, listen in to what she says. She says that happiness is so difficult to hold on to because our minds, our minds lie to us. Your intuitions are wrong. What is she saying? 
all of us instinctively look for happiness in places that rather than providing it, destroy it, erode it, demolish it. Money, career, property, but also smaller things. You might think, all I need to do is go home and just binge a whole series on Netflix. That'll make me feel better. Social media, that'll make me feel better. Oh, that'll make, I'm sure it will eventually make me feel better. And so we pour our efforts and energy and all of our endeavors into things which rather than creating and producing happiness, actually take it away. Now, what do you think of that? I, re- oh, I reckon she's spot on. I do it. Think about Australia for a moment. Think about our country. Um, at no other point in Australia's history have we been so healthy, so wealthy, so educated. There's less oppression today in Australian culture than there ever has been. Um, I'm not saying it's non-existent, but I'm saying compared to the, you know, yesteryear, we should be the happiest nation on earth because we have more stuff than nearly any nation on earth. And yet, are we? Are we? Are you part of the happiest nation on earth? Forget it. Get out of here. We are one of the highest, highest takers of antidepressant medication in the world. Skyrocketing levels of anxiety and depression. Suicide is still the number one cause of death for males under 40 in our nation. So we have this paradox take place, and you know it as well as I do. The greatest abundance, the greatest material worth, the greatest health, the greatest wealth, the greatest education, the less oppression has produced the greatest unhappiness. Why? Why is that? Well, this interviewer, um, she asked Santos that question. She goes, we can't find it in the things that we do. It takes away our happiness. So where do we find it? Well, Santos' answer was, oh, you're looking for it in the wrong places. Instead, look, look at these kind of places. Happiness is smelling your coffee in the morning, loving your kids, having sex and daisies and springtime. Here's the key quote. It's all the good things in life. That's what it is. Let me ask you again. What do you make of that? Feels good, doesn't it? Sounds right. Stop going to. Stop pursuing your contentment in things which will never give you contentment. Instead, pursue it in other things, ancient, pure, uncomplicated things. And I want to say, I, I'd love that to be true. You know, I've got two problems with it. One. Just get that up there for a minute, sorry. One, what happens if you don't have those things? What happens if you're in the Ukraine getting bombed? If you're in a sweatshop making our clothes to feed your family? What happens in the face of cancer? And your spouse dying? Or divorce? Or heartbreak? What happens if you can't have children? You don't have a spouse. You don't have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. But the second problem I have with it is even even more terrifying. What happens if you do have all those things and are still not happy? Man. I'm not here to rag on that as a a, a, um, philosophy of life. But I am here just to pose the question to you that if your greatest desire in life is happiness, your greatest intention and purpose in life is is satisfaction, then why is it that the very thing that we're apparently created for is the very thing that we find impossible to hold? Surely it stands to reason that if we're created for something. When you're hungry, your stomach growls. When you're thirsty, you you quench. So why are we searching for something which actually we can never feed? But I do want to say that's not the only perspective that I, I want to look at. Now, it goes without saying, of course, I am a Christian, you're in a church. And the perspective that I want to compare and contrast number one with is the perspective of life given to us by Jesus. Now, I don't know where you stand with Jesus. I don't know your background, your history, uh, how much you know or not. But let me give you a bit of detail about him so we're all on the same page. Jesus was a real life person who truly lived 2,000 years ago. That's beyond any historical question. Um, He was largely anonymous for most of his life and yet um, entered into uh, the public world around him as a religious teacher at some point into his 30s. He grew moderately popular 
uh, but it didn't last. He was uh, killed, murdered, crucified uh, around three years after he started preaching and teaching. There's something really weird about Jesus. The more you look at him, the more you dig into his life, you become aware that it's almost as if every time Jesus became popular, he seemed to deliberately sabotage his popularity. Some of us, that just happens naturally. For Jesus... He seemed to do it deliberately. He shrugged off every attempt to gain influence, power, and authority. Okay, All the things that we would love, doesn't want a bar of it. Anytime people began to say, hey, I think I like what you're saying, he goes, no, you don't. You just haven't understood it. Hey, get rid of them. <laughs> Any attempt to make him powerful or prestigious within his community, he would flee from it. Jesus never wrote a book. He never wrote a song. He never fought in a battle or won a war. No one drew a picture of him while he was alive. We've got no idea what he looks like. None of the things we normally associate with influence and power are the things that he did. And yet I would suggest to you, well, that's what's most mesmerizing about Jesus, because the man that I have just told you about is he's the most influential human being who's ever lived. And, and that's Doubly strange when you realize that right at the center of what he was telling people is that he is God. He's saying, I I'm the son of God. And normally if you meet someone who claims to be God, it's kind of back in the corner away. Cool, cool, I'm sure. That's great. Walk away. And yet despite claiming that, well, H.G. Wells is a famous author from the 20th century, not a Christian. This is what he says. I am a historian. I am not a believer. But I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in history. The question is, why? Well, one of the key ways of understanding the influence of Jesus, the enduring influence of Jesus is simply to understand his words. It wasn't a battle, it wasn't a song, it wasn't a picture, it wasn't a painting. It's just the things that he said. When Jesus spoke, people listened, and they still listened. The world we live in is shaped by him more than anyone else. Now, Jesus spoke about many things when he was alive, but one of the things he spoke about, you may be surprised, you may have no idea about this, but one of the things he spoke about more than anything else was you. You. He spoke about you, he spoke about me, he spoke about meaning. And what he said was incredibly controversial. It was incredibly confrontational. Jesus said, life isn't about happiness. It's not about happiness. He's not anti-happiness, he's not anti-joy, he's not a joy kill, he's not saying you shouldn't be happy. He's just saying the main game of your existence is not just being happy. Life isn't about happiness, it's about Meaning. Now hold on there, just wait. The goal in life is to live a meaningful life, regardless of circumstance and situation, not consumed by everything around you, but to live a life of meaning. The question is, what's the meaning? And I want to show you from, from the part of the Bible that we had read to us before. It's going to be all on the screen now from, from Luke chapter 10. I want you to have a look. I'm going to read it for you again. But I want you, as I read it, to try and pick up, if you can, where Jesus says meaning will be found. Now, let me read it for you. Luke, 25, Luke, sorry, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 28. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, just pause there for a moment. This teacher of the law, that's not a lawyer, it's a religious leader. He's trying to trip Jesus up. He doesn't like Jesus. He's trying to trip Jesus up. And he asks him about eternal life. Now, that's a really important expression. Eternal life is referring to two things. Heaven. Heaven, life forever, but also life here right now, living according to meaning. In other words, he's really asking Jesus, what have I got to do to live a meaningful life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Now, Jesus says life is not about happiness. It's about meaning. But what's the meaning? 
The meaning of your life is love. Loving relationships. To love and be loved. You were created for each other. We were created for one another. We were created to love and be loved. That is true richness in human life. That is the essence of why we're here. And I want to say I'm utterly persuaded and convinced that that is true, not just because I'm a Christian. Because as I reflect on my own life and the own, my own journey in life, where my whole life was consumed with seeking joy and satisfaction and meaning in any number of ways, as I reflect on my own life, I think that's absolutely true. And I think you do as well. Let me try and show you how. I want you right now to visualize the best person that you know. Can you do that for me? Just think about who is it. Think about the best person that you know. And now let me ask you a question. What is it about them that makes them good? Think of it this way. What makes a good person good? Now, in a moment, I want you to turn to that person again you were just chatting to, and I want you to talk about that. Just a tip, though, if you're sitting next to your husband or your wife, <laughs> your boyfriend or your girlfriend, say them. <laughs> oh, it's your life. Do what you want, okay? I'm not here to tell you what to do, but, oi, you, whatever you want. What makes a good person good? What are the character traits? What are we talking about here? So have a chat, and then we'll, we'll share with each other. Go for it. All right, guys, what did you come up with? What, what is it that makes a good person good? What do you have? Selfless. Sel who said that, sorry? Selfless. That's the key, isn't it? Selfless, the putting of others first. Putting of other people first. Excellent, yeah. Anyone else? Selfless integrity. Integrity. Doing what they'll say, saying what they'll do. Um, that their yes is yes, their no is no. Yeah, awesome. Money. <laughs> I'll, I'll change that one and say cash. No, I'll change it and say generous. How about that? Generous with money. <laughs> Are you from Wollongong? No. You wouldn't be. You said money. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Good heart. Yeah, spot on. Showing that kind of love to other people. Yeah. Humor. Humor. Good. What did someone else say? Kind. kind. If you think about the, the people in your life who have created the biggest impression on you, for most of us, It's not success by the world standards, or can I say success by even our own standards, when we, if the evidence of our lives was, um, so if the content of our lives was evidence of what we truly valued, well, money, property, ambition, desire, influence, all those things, absolutely, they're all mixed up. But when we can actually think about it with clarity, when we think about the people who have shown us the greatest richness in life, it's not in money, although that may be part of how they've done it. It's in love, isn't it? Is that what you think? It's in the way that they treat each other, the way they treat other people, the way they treat even people who don't like them or love them back. Jesus says, the meaning of your life is not happiness. There's nothing wrong with being happy. But it's not the main game. The main game is relationship. And I, and I want to say, what do you think of that? 
You know, it's no wonder that Jesus is actually, um, he's still popular. Even people who don't really know anything about him are kind of like, yeah, Jesus, he's all about love, right? Like he's good. In fact, even people who say he's definitely not God, he's definitely not a Christian. Yeah, he's good. He's all about love, loving other people. This is a good thing to do. And I want to say, yeah, it is, isn't it? Jesus is all about loving other people. But, do you remember how I told you Jesus, every time he seemed to grow moderately popular, he'd always kind of sabotage. As you got closer, you realized things are different. I, I, I want to show you now that there's, there's a twist in what Jesus is saying. A twist that actually changes everything. It doesn't mean what he said wasn't true, but it reveals to us a whole new perspective of our own lives. Check out the passage again. Have a look. Now, I don't know if you noticed before, but um, when I asked you what makes a good person good, all of you, all of us, talked about ways that we treat each other, ways that we interact with one another. But no one, not one person, and can I say, I actually ask this question quite a lot to people, different communities, different cultures, different contexts, and, and it's not just you guys, it's, it's all of us. Not one person hardly ever, ever, ever mentions how we treat God. Yet look at this passage again. What does Jesus say is of primary importance to do and live? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Make no mistake, Jesus says we are to love other people. Make no mistake about that whatsoever. But according to Jesus, what makes true goodness, the true richness and meaning of life, is not only found in the way that we treat one another, but rather that that springs from how we, how we treat God, how we relate with God. Jesus says the meaning and purpose of your life is to have a loving relationship with God. That's why you're alive. That's why you're here. That's what your entire existence is about. God created you to be in a relationship with him. And I want to say that's both good and bad news, isn't it? You see, there's two truths that are weaving their way through Jesus' entire ministry. When you look at his biographies in the Bible and you listen to his teaching, there's two truths weaving their way all throughout. Number one, what does it mean when Jesus says the meaning of our life is to love God? What it means is that God loves you. Now, I want to step back for a minute and say, well, you might have heard that before. Sure, sure. No, no, no. God loves you more than you've ever loved anyone in your life. God loves you more than you even love yourself, and that's love. God loves you. He calls you to love him with everything that you've got because he loves you with everything that you've got. No matter where you've been, what you've seen, what you've done, he loves you. He created you for his love because he loves you. You're not a stranger to him. You matter to him. You're not an accident to him. He knows your name. He loves you. But the second truth Why did none of us talk about God? If loving God is the center of human existence, why did none of us talk about it? Because we don't do it. Not the way Jesus says. Look what he says. Oh. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and your strength. With everything. And that doesn't mean just acknowledging him from time to time when you want something. It doesn't mean thinking of him again now and again if you're ever in trouble. It means listening and loving him with everything. And according to Jesus, and Jesus says this more than anyone else, that's a problem. Because we do not do it. And the word that Jesus uses to describe that kind of interaction with God is the word sin. Now, sin is a word that has a lot of baggage in, in a lot of communities. It can be used as a battering ram against people really unhelpfully. Or you can think of it as a list of rules and regulations, do's and don'ts. And those things may indeed be examples of sin. But that's not the heart of sin. The heart of sin is the human heart and the way we reject God. Can I tell you, I told you before, I grew up religious. My family went to church and I heard about this all the time. And I was always sort of like, sin, get over it, God, who cares? But I thought that because I didn't get it. Let me try and illustrate it a different way. That might, well, for you, let me, 
I want you to imagine that you've got a, you've got a child. Okay, you've got, and this child is amazing. Okay, at school, top of every, every subject, English, math, history, Chinese, also Mandarin, Cantonese, Arabic, everything that they do, they're top. They're the lead in the school musical, but they're also sporty. They're a real renaissance person. You know, they're incredible at everything. Every sport they try their hand at, the best, athletics, swimming, school captain. They're only in year eight, and they're the school captain. <laughs> Let me ask you as a parent right now, is this a good child? Oi, don't say no. Yes. <laughs> I'm just getting started. This kid gets home, doesn't drop their bag on the floor, picks it up, hangs it up, takes out their lunchbox, <gasps> brings it over, throws out the things. In fact, there's nothing they didn't eat. They ate everything, okay, washes it up. They do the same for their siblings. Oh. They start making food for everyone. They cook dinner for everyone. They serve it all up. They make it all perfect. They do the washing up. They do their homework. They help their siblings with their homework. They go into Zoom and they, they talk to, to someone on the other side of the world to help them with their homework as well. They're absolutely incredible. As a parent, is this a good child? Don't be silly. Yes. This child is a wonderful reflection of your amazingness. <laughs> but there's just one part of their character, their makeup, I haven't mentioned. And that is that in their entire life, they've never once spoken to you. They've never once acknowledged your existence. You hear about them at school and you say, darling, congratulations, and they just walk straight past you. They couldn't care less. They do all this stuff at home. They, they do everything, that you, and you say, thank you, and they, they look through you. At night time, they, they turn off their lamp at 9 o'clock, and you go up there to tuck them in and kiss them goodnight and whisper, I love you, and they turn their back on you as if you're invisible. Let me ask you another question. As a parent, is this a good child? If not, why not? I'll tell you why. Because as a parent, the one thing that matters the most, the one thing you want the most, the one thing they were created for is a relationship, is love. And you would get rid of anything else to get it. You'd sacrifice the rest in a heartbeat for one kiss, one I love you, one I hug, and its presence does not negate the absence of the relationship. Oh, my dear friends, you can be a success at any number of things in your life. You may be the best single human being in your class, in your course, at your work. You may be incredible, but Jesus is saying that if you miss the main thing of life, a relationship with God... None of the rest of it means anything. And so I want to say, let's just press pause there for a moment. Okay, let's press, press, press pause with me. Because we actually find ourselves in a really difficult position when it comes to Jesus. Because Jesus has actually offered us a predicament that is very similar to, to perspective number one. Perspective number one says, be happy. The predicament, we can't do it. But here Jesus says, the meaning of your life is a relationship with God, a loving relationship with God. And yet Jesus, more than anyone else, says, impossible. You haven't done it. You haven't done it. And if you try to be perfect from now on, if you try to love him with everything, you won't even make it to the car park. So how can Jesus tell you the meaning of your life is to do something that's actually impossible? How can Jesus tell you that the very center of your existence, the reason you're alive, is to do something that you're not capable of? There's only one possible reason. There's only one possible answer. The only reason Jesus could tell you that the meaning of your life is something impossible is if the meaning of his life is to make the impossible possible. And that means that the words that we've heard from, from the Bible, the words that we've heard are not solely about you. They're not just pointing to you about what you haven't done. They're pointing to him. 
but what he's come to do. What is the meaning of Jesus' life? Well, we don't have to wonder. He tells us. Just a few chapters later, Luke 19, verse 10. This is what he says. He gives this little description of his life. He says this, My mission in life, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Son of Man is kind of like a code word about himself as, as, as God. I have come to seek, search out, and save the lost. Now, save, that word literally means rescue. So Jesus is saying, I've come to earth as God on a rescue mission. But who is he rescuing? The lost. But he's not talking about people who are geographically lost. He's talking about people who are spiritually lost. What makes someone spiritually lost? He's talking about people who do not know God who do not have a loving relationship with God, who are not living according to the meaning that they were created for. Jesus says, I've come to rescue us. And not long after he said these words, um, like he always did, he, he walked into trouble. He went to Jerusalem, the capital city of the country he was in. Just also the capital of the hatred for him. He even then had the opportunity for power and prestige, but he shrugged it off. He ran away from it. He ended up betrayed by one of his best mates, abandoned by his closest followers, put on trial, tortured, and eventually killed. Why did Jesus die? love to make the impossible possible Jesus died as your substitute he died with your name on his lips with your sin on his soul the barrier that's created between us and God because of the way that we've rejected him again and again and again it was destroyed as Jesus took the punishment from his father that we deserve. Jesus died. But he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And, and listen to this. He promises that if anyone trusts in him and what he has done, if you put your trust in him, not in yourself, not in your own goodness, not in your own righteousness, not in your own ability to be perfect, but if you trust in what he has done on your behalf, your sins are forgiven, but check this out. You enter into eternal life with God today, now. You enter and are reconciled into a relationship with the God who made you and loves you for that relationship. How much does God love you? He loves you so much. He sent his own son to die so you can live to make the impossible possible. Now, what does all of that mean? Well, let me just say one thing. What it means is that there's a reason... None of the things in this world that you're currently seeking satisfaction, joy, contentment in will ever give you what you're looking for. And that is because you're designed to only find it in Jesus. It also means that it's very, very possible for you to spend your entire life pouring your effort and energy into things that ultimately will not matter. But you don't have to. I asked you at the beginning, um, what words would you like said at your funeral? And, you know, I reckon when we think about it, we can think about a whole bunch of wonderful words about the ways we've treated each other. Selfless, love, generous, kind. Those would be terrific words. I'd love for people to say that about me. I'm a work in progress. Not there yet, hopefully. I hope that it'd be wonderful if people said those things about me. But you know what? There's actually only three words that matter that could be said about me. And whether anyone says it when I'm gone, it doesn't matter. But there's really only three words that matter to me. And those words are saved by 
love. That I don't stand before God as a good bloke. I don't stand before God working my own way. I stand before God as someone who's been rescued by his son so I can have the life I was designed for. So what I want to say tonight is, what about you? It could be that tonight, as you've come, you, you've, you've been invited, you've been blackmailed, you've been manipulated, you've been coerced into coming, you didn't want to come, you've sat through all of this, you're not quite sure why, but somehow, somewhere, this has made sense to you and you realise that you actually do need to know God, you do want to know him, you know Jesus died for you. Or perhaps you've been coming for all of your life and you've been faking it and you're sick of faking it and you want to actually enter into a relationship with God. Or perhaps you've done it before, but you've wandered and you want, to, you want to come back and do the same thing. Well, what I want to do right now is, is give you the opportunity to talk to God and do just that. You know, I became a Christian when I was 28 years old because someone explained to me that Jesus Christ died for the worst people in the world. The worst people in the world. That what justified us to God was not our goodness, but was our trust in Jesus. And so what I want to do what I want to do is pray a prayer. And this isn't Harry Potter. It's not magical. It's not a spell. It's just a bunch of words of ordinary people speaking to an extraordinary God. Um, and as I pray this, I'd love to invite you, if that's you, to just pray along silently in your own head. You're not going to have to stand up or put your hand up or nothing like that. It's just about you and God. Not about me, you and God, but you and God. But I do want to promise you that God loves you and he's listening and he wants to hear from you. So I'm going to ask everyone here... Don't worry about anyone else, but I'm going to ask you to shut your eyes and bow your heads and don't look around, don't talk to others. Um, but I want to invite you to pray uh, with me if you'd like to take God up on his offer of life. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, I know that I haven't lived my life your way. I know I've rejected your love. I know that in my speaking, in my actions, in my thoughts, I've said no to you again and again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've acted like that. Thank you that Jesus died and rose again for me so that my sins can be forgiven. Please forgive me and cleanse me from all my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. Please come to me and take full control of my life and help me to live with Jesus as my Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, if you have prayed, I just want to say it's awesome. It's about you and God. But the Bible tells us that God rejoices and his angels rejoice every time one of his children comes home to his family the way that we're designed to. And please don't keep that to yourself. Please let us know. But I also, also want to say, if you haven't prayed, if you're not ready or if you're not sure, you want to keep looking into it, awesome. Awesome. We'd love to encourage you to keep coming along on a Saturday night or uh, to the upcoming Life Explored course as well to keep um, investigating the truth about Jesus. Now, in a few moments' time, we're going to finish our time together by singing. But before we do that, we want to give everyone in this room the opportunity to give us some feedback and thoughts about how tonight went. But also, um, let us know uh, whether you've prayed or not. So on your, on your chair, you'll find this little card uh, and, a, and a pencil. Does everyone have one of those? Pick one of those up. Uh, this little card and a pencil. Uh, it's got a QR code on it as well, but I reckon do it in pencil because, you know, we've got enough, done enough QR coding, haven't we, to last a lifetime. So on this card and with that pencil, I want to give everyone here the opportunity, just, just a minute, to fill that out. Now, you might be a regular and think, well, I'm not going to fill it out, but I'll tell you what, every time you do it, it makes new people feel less weird. Okay, so I want to ask you to do that. I also want to ask you to do it in silence, if you can, so that you give other people space and freedom to fill it out without distraction. There's going to be some light music playing for around 30 seconds or a minute or so. I'll just invite you to, to fill that out, um, and then I'm going to tell you what happens next. So go for it, fill it out, and I'll, I'll chat to you in a minute.
Thanks so much. Well, guys, thank you so much for, for filling that out. I really appreciate it. As I said, we're going to finish by singing now. And in one of the songs, uh, a bucket's going to come by. Uh, and that's not for your money, okay? It's not for your cash. Um, uh, it's for this card. And we'd love to invite you to pop that in there. I want to promise you that um, the only people who will see that card are um, staff, some of the pastors here uh, and leaders here. So it's not going to go over rare. Just some people will have a look at it, uh, people that you can trust. Uh, and feel free to pop that in as the bucket comes by. Um, but what better thing than we can do right now than to stand and to sing in great praise to our great God who loves us so much. So I invite you all to stand uh, as we sing. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, 1 John 4.19 says, We love because he, God, first loved us. Um, and we're going to sing now about yeah, the lengths that God went to um, to love us through Jesus on the cross. So let's sing. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory On his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an but this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I 
How good is that? How good is that hearing from Dave tonight? Um, I was super encouraged. Um, and if you've come out of that with questions, um, if you've filled out the form, 
um, saying you want to find out more or you've made the decision to commit to Jesus, um, that is so good. Um, if you want to chat to someone, come chat to the person you came with or me out the front. I believe there'll be people at the back as well. But how good is it hearing that Jesus came for love to save us and to be in a right relationship with us? So that is awesome news, news for everyone here. A um, couple of things. We're going to hang around. We're going to have some food together. Um, there's hamburgers. As I said earlier, um, if you're new, this is on us. But if you're not, five bucks, you can pay by cash or you can use a, a tappy device thing. Um, also, uh, another reminder, that we're doing the Life Explored course. If you do want to find out more about what the Bible says, find out more about Jesus, this is a great place to start. So details on the screen or come speak to um, Pudgy, Dave, myself or someone else you came with about it. Um, cool, I think that's it. I'm going to pray to wrap up and then we can hang out and have some food. Dear Lord, um, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Um, we thank you that he came, even though we did not deserve it, he came to save us, um, to do the impossible, to put us in a right relationship with you, Lord, the way we have been designed, created for, and that is the meaning of life, Lord. Um, we pray as we spend time together now, um, we pray that our conversations um, are, are great, encouraging to one another. Um, we can have some fun as well, hanging out and enjoying food, Lord. Um, we thank you for tonight, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen. See you next week. Oh, yeah, come back next week. Yeah.